Good morning and welcome to Hunton Baptist Church. It is great to see you this morning, uh, especially those that are visiting us online uh, faithfully every each and every week. Thank you so much for being a part of this church. Um, if you're a first time visitor or business um, in this church, we would really appreciate if you would fill out a welcome card uh, more than anything just so we can just say thank you. Thank you for being here, being a part of the service. Um, when you do that, you can just put it in the offering plate um, as you leave the service or you can hand it to the pastor or myself or one of the ushers and we'll be, we get in touch with you. I have a few announcements, um, some calendar events. Um, one for today is 7 p.m. Remember there's adult choir for cantata practice um, at 7 p.m. today. Also on Tuesday, there's the senior adult luncheon. Um, Paul Mueller will be the guest of honor that day. So he is an amazing musician. So if you get a chance to come out and hear him, it is totally worth it. Um, 6 p.m. Um, on Tuesday, there'll be the Spring Fling planning meeting. Um, if you want more information or if, if you're going to be able to show up, um, you can let Kathy Truslow or Tanya Sharon know. Um, they are the ones that will be leading that. And that is to help get things in place and going for our Easter celebration uh, here at the church. One special note that I just, I just want to touch base with um, that I'd sent to... to Frank earlier in this week, but um, this this is a time this month that we can raise money um, to help support those in Ukraine. Um, there are organizations that are already in place that are already doing things there uh, for the people there, and that's the BGAB, the CBF, the IMB, and the NAM, and those two work together. All three of those organizations are doing their own directive in the country, um, but what they're doing is something that's already existed. Um, for example, one of the places that I would like you to be in prayer for later, and I know Frank might be touching on this, but it's special to my heart, is through the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, um, they lost their, their building. Um, it was bombed, um, the village of Hope in Cave. If you look on page six, you can read a little bit about that. Um, if you go up into the youth room and you go into the little kitchen and you look at the refrigerator, it's an old refrigerator. If you look on the freezer, there's a picture of Gennady. Um, Gennady Podaski. I don't know if I'm saying his name correct or not, but there's a picture of him with children from a long time ago. They started this ministry in 2003, and um, I seen that every time I'm in the little kitchen. I see that, and I see his face, and I see his face with those children, and I think about those children now that are in that picture are probably old enough to be fighting in this war, um, but that ministry is vital, what they have done there, uh, but they have lost their facility completely. They are safe. They were able to get out. And I know that some of them are still in the country helping the needs of the people. Um, I know that Gandhi and many are helping outside with the refugees. But to remember that, you know, we have connections um, in what is going on in this world. Um, and I think of these families and what we can be doing for them and remember them in prayer. In fact, let's do that right now. Let's lift up Gennady and Mina Podaski. Let's pray. Lord God, I lift up the village of Hope in Kaif. I know that the building doesn't exist anymore, but the ministry still does. The people, the heart of the church are there. They're in the Ukraine still doing the work. They're on the border still caring for the needs of others. And we ask you to be with them and lift them up. And may we as a church be able to financially support any of the needs that are there. The one way we can help besides prayer, Lord, um, may we continue to always remember what's going on. Remember those in prayer and lift them up to you and know that they are not alone, that they are loved and embraced by you. Lord, we give thanks to you that we have faithful followers like them. And Lord, we give thanks here for those that are so faithful and caring and loving in this church that live out your calling. May we celebrate this day for you, Lord. No matter what's going on in this world, may we celebrate you. May we lift you up. And may we come here to praise and worship you. In Christ's name, amen.
say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. Amen. Good morning. How are everyone doing Good. on this uh, nice, warm, sunny, <laughs> oh, not warm, excuse me, cold Sunday morning. Um, you know, that last song said, you know, talked about when the world is it should be. And it seems like we're in a time of just, everything seems to be so chaotic. Um, and we come to church in the Father's house to praise his name and to strengthen ourselves and our souls by hearing the word of God preached by Pastor Frank. Um, it's more important than ever. These people are over in Ukraine right now and they're fighting for their, for their lives. And we're here and we do support them as Paige said in prayer. But we need to be strong as Christians every day, even though we can roam about freely, because you never know what tomorrow may hold. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 6, verse 11, he said, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And we need to do that because the devil is alive and well, and we need to be prepared. Salvation, he rose 
and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He did conquer the grave. Praise God. So, first of all, Mike Parsley, I believe that was the best mini sermon I've ever heard. <laughs> truly. Truly. And secondly, Ronnie. I'm looking for some higher live stream numbers here today. We have fewer here with us right now. And, well, then again, we may not because they're probably still sleeping. <laughs> oh, well, lose the hour. But it, you'll be glad come into this day. You can have light on your side. It is so good to see you. I um, want to let you know, first of all, if you didn't see it in your bulletin already, these flowers are provided by... Heather Thorne and her family in memory of her mother, Karen Matthews. Today would be Karen's 69th birthday. You know, it's so strange to think March 13th, uh, three members of Hunton who had March 13th birthdays have passed away since my being here. Not only Karen Matthews, but Connie Martz and John Benton. And you know, we miss all of these good folks, but we know that they're with the Lord, and for that we praise Him. Today, of course, too, we remember an anniversary coming up next week. We're so thankful that Diana Mullis moved her membership back to Hunton not long ago. She and Odell will be celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary uh, next Sunday, which, by the way, is the first day of spring. It's kind of hard to think about right now, isn't it? But first day of spring, next Sunday. In addition to what Paige mentioned, of course, with so many prayers needed for Ukraine, and you see in the bulletin a lot of different ways you can help, and not only praying, but financially giving. There are a number of prayer requests listed here on page 5 in your bulletin. For those who are watching online, first of all, we want to pray that true peace will reign in Ukraine. Secondly, that those who are stuck or have to stay in the cities surrounded by fighting will be kept safe. Those traveling, we pray for safe travels, uh, welcoming arms to them, of course, and hot food and places to sleep. And that churches there in Ukraine will be able to minister to all, and Poland and other places too. Churches across Europe, of course, have become shelters for these refugees. And of course, it's interestingly, as they put it here, replacing pulpits and pews with beds and blankets, taking church to the people. This is what we need to be about to every day. And that leaders will know the guidance and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Those are so, so important that we continue to pray for. And then we have a lot of folks here at Hunton that we need to be continuing to remember. Thankfully, Brenda Edwards got through her surgery well this week, as did Chris Lee. And this week, we want to remember Cheryl McBee with an ablation procedure on Tuesday and Pat Hemsworth, cataract surgery on Wednesday. Uh, also, Lucina Heath got through her knee replacement surgery. She had to stay an extra day in the hospital, but she did get out yesterday and then headed on down to North Carolina. Um, Robin took her down halfway to meet uh, Lucina's sister, Pat, and she's going to stay with Pat for about two and a half weeks in time of recovery. So let's remember Lucina in that regard. And let's also remember Brenda Vela. Uh, for whatever reason, Brenda was transported to Southside Regional Medical Center in Petersburg. Um, you know, that was way south of the river, and it's another country, but she's there. Uh, was able to make that trek yesterday. Courage, but I'm very concerned because she wasn't sure if she was going to have to have surgery. She didn't want to have extensive surgery 
for this infection that has built up. And lo and behold, not 10 minutes after I left there, the doctor came in and told her, you do not have to have that surgery. And she was so relieved. And so let's pray, but she will stay on antibiotics for a period of time uh, to clear the pneumonia and infection. So remember Brenda Vella, and also her niece, you may or may not know her niece is Gail Thurston, and Gail's trying to be there for her as well. The last concern I wanted to share is a very sad one. Got a call yesterday um, from Tommy Donovan. This is Carol's younger son. Tommy informed me that about a week ago, his mom made the decision to not continue her dialysis. She did that about a week ago, so she's been without it now. That period of time, um, medically speaking, maybe another week, slightly more. Uh, but let's remember Carol and her family, uh, pray for her peace. She is right now over at Memorial Regional Medical Center. Uh, as of yesterday, she was in room 2109. They may move her to more of a hospice room, I'm not sure. Um, I'll try to find out when I go over today. But let's remember the Donovan family during this time. As you know, she lost her good friend, Gator Davis, not long ago, and it's been a tough road for her health-wise as well. As we come to the Lord, too, today, we thank Him for the opportunity to give back to Him, not only through our prayers and our time, but through our tithes and our offerings. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. You're so good to do that. We want to continue to give back to the Lord in ways that will enable people to come to know Christ and also meet physical needs, as an example in Ukraine right now. So as we pray now, let's lift up this means and this time of worship. It is an integral part of worship as we give back to Him. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us prayer and the vehicle uh, communication with you. As we pray now, so many times, Father, we find ourselves guilty if we stop back and realize it, that so much of our praying is about asking, asking you for certain things. But Lord, help us to be mindful that the most important thing is a relationship with you. Father, you gave us everything. As we think about your son, Jesus Christ, and you're giving your one and only son to us, how he gave his very life unconditionally, freely. Father, that's the way we want to worship you. No matter what's going on in our lives, we want to worship you. Lord, you are our only hope. Help us to realize that with each passing day. And as Mike said, Lord, may we take advantage of those opportunities to share the love of Christ everywhere we go, wherever we are. Father, today, for all of these we've named, we lift them up. For those in Europe, we lift them up. Father, for those who are celebrating occasions this week, we lift them up. And Lord, every tithe and every offering, every dollar given, we lift those up. And we pray, God, that you would use all of our being for your glory. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen.
Can't say enough about all the technical support around here. Just noticed my battery had died on my microphone, and Bernie got it all set up for me, so we're good. Thank you for being here again today and for blessing our fellowship here. We have three folks who've come a distance, I believe, right? Mike and Dawn Ham are here from Pennsylvania. Yay. Yay, we're glad to have them back with us today. And Benjamin Brown is here from Virginia Beach and Regent University. 
on his spring break this week. So we praise God for allowing us to come and worship in spirit and in truth. Today, just to let you know, as I did on email this week, um, the topic for today, which is basically centered around God's Word, uh, well, I was inspired by Sarah Sheeran and something that she had suggested earlier, and we're going to try to cover some of that in the next week and two. And so I thank Sarah, and I thank others of you who, from time to time, share things with me that are important to you, and I believe, as I hear those, that they are important to all of us. Certainly this is today. I wanted to share with a little story to begin with, and this is shared in honor of Bill Patch. Bill may not be in the room right now. He'll be later. He's fixing the coffee. He'll be in here later in the second service. Be back, I should say. But uh, it seems, and maybe you've heard this one, it's been around a while, but there was an elderly woman who had just returned home from an evening church service when she realized there was an intruder in her home. And seeing that this man was in the act of robbing her home and all of the valuables, the lady yelled out, Acts 238. Hearing her, the burglar stopped dead in his tracks and stood motionless. So then the woman calmly called the police and explained what was going on. As the officer cuffed the man to take him in, he asked the burglar, Why did you just stand there? All the lady did was yell a Bible verse to you. Bible verse, said the burglar. She said she had an axe and two thirty-eights. <laughs> now, as you may or may not know, Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what she was saying to the man. It stopped him in his tracks. That should stop us too. That was, uh, that was great Bible memorization on her part, wasn't it? I just think that is so good. But sometimes people misuse the Bible. And they'll do so in all sorts of weird ways. Did you hear the story of the guy who, he needed some guidance from the Bible, and so he decided to do it sort of randomly and let just God lead him. So he closed his eyes, and then he opened and he put his finger on a verse. And the verse read, Judas went out and hanged himself. He thought, well, that can't be God's will for me. So he tried again. He went to another verse, did it again, and it said, Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> and he knew there must be some mistake. So he tried once more, and then, of course, he came to this verse. It said, What thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> you know, it can be dangerous, very dangerous, to use the Bible in the wrong way. Today, this message, this sermon, is focused on one of the most spiritual disciplines in all of life, and that is our interaction with God's Word. We may laugh at those stories, but it's no laughing matter when people really use the Bible improperly. Today, I'd like to read from God's Word here, and this is the second letter to Timothy in this pastoral epistle here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. And of course, Paul is writing here to Timothy, who is doing his best to pastor a congregation. He says, remind them of this and charge them before the Lord to avoid disputing about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Avoid such godless chatter, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will eat its way like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth by holding that the resurrection is past already. 
They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. This reading of God's holy word is blessed indeed. Here in 2 Timothy 2.14, Paul, he tells Timothy to solemnly charge those who are under his pastoral ministry in the presence of God that if they misuse the Bible, it will lead to ruin. In fact, we get the word catastrophe. That's a strong word. Something is catastrophic. Catastrophe comes from the Greek word for ruin. Paul, of course, means ultimate spiritual ruin. He names Hymenaeus and Philetus here, who had gone astray from the truth, upsetting the faith of some with their misuse of the Bible. Paul is saying that while the misuse of the Bible leads to ungodliness, God's people should use the Bible to grow in godliness. How important it is today and every day that we stand squarely, squarely on God's Word. God's Word is really impregnated, if you will, with, with life, wisdom, truth, power, potential. When He created the world, God simply said, let there be. Every word He speaks contains the power to create whatever He says. Every promise He makes contains the seeds of its own fulfillment. Those seeds have a scheduled season for fulfillment in your life. And when they're watered with confident, faith-filled prayer, standing squarely on the Scriptures and patiently awaiting God's timing, then His Word cannot fail. Once you grasp this truth, there are three words that can have such meaning. I use these words, or at least a portion of these words, on a regular basis. Perhaps you do too. My good friends at the drive through at McDonald's, they know them well. Because I inevitably say to them, him or her, God bless you. Or God bless your day. Or God bless. And I don't say that lightly. And I don't say that lightly to anyone. Because what I realize is, when we say God bless you, those are loaded words. Speaking them releases God's blessing into our lives. When you say God bless you, God backs you up. God says, whenever you bless people in my name, I myself will bless them. So if you want to bless your loved ones, speak words of blessing to them. Asking someone, how are you? That's an expression of courtesy and care, for sure. And when you say, have a nice day, no doubt you sincerely mean it. I do hope you have a nice day. But when you say, God bless you, and understand the scriptural truth behind those words, God's blessing can change that person's life. Author Kate Nowak says this, It should be a habit, this business of blessing others. I've come to realize it's one of the most powerful and practical ways for reconnecting with each other, our world, and life itself. The most phenomenal way possible to lead us to happiness and to success. A blessing is a sweet release from pain, and it's an ancient key to a successful and fulfilling life. So as we think about the words of blessing in the entirety of God's Word and standing squarely on God's Word, I have a few points I want to share with you this morning as we walk through these scriptures, these verses here in 2 Timothy 2. 
First of all, don't use the Bible for knowledge without obedience. I see this too often. Where those who have worked hard and studied hard and have gained all this knowledge in the Scripture, but I don't see it being obeyed in his or her life. Don't use the Bible in this way. Disputing about words here, it says in verse 14. That was a notorious characteristic characteristic of, (laughs) try it three times a charm, false teachers. Especially there in Ephesus where Paul had been. They liked to display their knowledge on peripheral matters that, did not lead to godliness, but only to pride over being right. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.5, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Stephen Cole said, Anytime you use the Bible to grow in knowledge apart from godliness, you're heading for spiritual trouble. One of the most common, one of the most common sins Satan uses to try to trip us up on is spiritual pride. Puffing us up with supposed knowledge. If you want to check something out, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. To know God truly in his holiness and majesty, oh, that will humble us. When you study the Bible, always ask, always ask, what does this teach me about God and myself? And then how should I apply this to my life? We should always be asking that when we look through the Scripture. Jesus argued for the resurrection. And it was based on the present rather than the past tense of a Hebrew verb found in Exodus 3.6. Okay, this is just an example of what he did. He went back to Exodus 3.6 and he looked at the present rather than the past. And he taught then that the smallest letter of the law would not pass away without being fulfilled. Look at Matthew 5.7. It's important to study the precise words of Scripture and to understand the nuance of the original languages so that we can interpret it properly. Now, hear me on this. Paul is not saying that growing in spiritual knowledge through Scripture is unimportant. It is very important. But rather, what Paul is here combating He's combating those who like to get into all of this intellectual banter, if you will. And they get into this uh, dialogue and banter over obscure points of doctrine. But yet they are not seeking to grow in obedience to God. It's almost like a game they're trying to win. These scholars like to prove their superior intelligence by winning theological debates. If you don't don't hear anything else today, hear this. But the point, the point of scriptural knowledge is not to fill our heads, but to change our lives. To use the Bible for knowledge without application and obedience is to misuse it. Secondly, don't use the Bible for worldly gain. By all means. Here in the 16th verse, Paul refers to worldly and empty chatter. It has this nuance of trafficking lightly in the things of God or of using God in the Bible for worldly gain. 
I'm sure you're aware that this sort of thing is rampant. It is rampant in American Christianity here in our day. The health and wealth heresy, if you will. It's perhaps the most blatant form of it. Also, many Christian self-help books approach the Bible from the, from the perspective of how to gain what you want in life. Oh, what do you want in life? What do you want out of life? Read this book. It does that rather than reverently coming to it to, to learn how to please God. It is using the Bible for worldly success. And that is wrong. Note two things with me, if you will. First, such teachers, preachers, they're always popular. Always popular. Their talk will spread like gangrene, as the scripture says here. You don't have to help gangrene to spread. It will spread. Because they appeal to the flesh. These false teachers, they never lack a following. Some of the largest churches in America use the Bible to help people succeed in their worldly, selfish goals. But don't judge a church by how big it is, but rather by how sound the teaching is in producing genuine godliness. People who buy into this kind of false teaching often testify about how much they've been helped. And often, outwardly it is, it's, it's true. But anytime people are helped out of their troubles without learning to depend more on the living God and submit themselves more fully to His leadership, it is false help. Second, Christians are to avoid such teachers and their teaching. Here in verse 16, once again, steer clear of them. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time watching them on TV or reading their books. What Augustine or Augustine wrote over 1,500 years ago applies here. For to believe what you please and to not believe what you please is to believe yourselves and not the gospel. Oh, I like that part of Scripture. I'm going to take that one. Oh, over here. Oh, no, no, no. I'll stay away from that one. That messes up my status quo. We pick and choose. We take out of context. By appealing to the flesh and the lure of the world, these false teachers, these false preachers, draw away after them people who are not fully submissive to the lordship of Christ and his gospel of the cross. To use the Bible for worldly gain is to misuse it. In the third place this morning, don't use the Bible to teach half-truths as truth. These men here, and Paul was very quick to point out specific names. Of course, this was a personal letter to Timothy. He had to get real with him. Timothy was trying to learn. A protege wanted to do his best. But these men here, they were, they were not totally wrong. Okay? They, were, they were teaching a half-truth. But they were teaching that half-truth as if it were the whole truth. And that's another one of Satan's favorite methods, I believe. They were teaching that the resurrection already had taken place. They had verses from Paul to, pack, to back up their views. And they went back to Paul here, right? What Paul had said. Because he wrote often of the fact that Christ is risen and that we're risen with him. 
Okay? That's what Paul was saying. Christ is risen, and we're risen with him. But he also taught that there is a future resurrection of the body, which these men denied. They argued that the resurrection was only spiritual, and thus it was an accomplished fact. You might be wondering, well, what's the big deal? Why was this worth contending about? Well, Paul answers that question in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he says that if there is no future, literal, bodily resurrection, then Christ himself is not even raised. And our faith is worthless. You see how you can take things and take parts of them and use them for your own manipulation? May it not be so. Mark it well. Heresy always begins as truth out of balance. There is always an element of truth in the teaching of the cults. Just about any cult you can think of, there's an element of of truth in there. And that's how they entice people. That's how they're lured into their entrapment. They even have verses to back up their errors. So they prey on the untaught who are looking for something more in their faith. But they lead people away from dependence on the living God. Now if somebody today handed you a $3 bill with Frank Sinatra's picture on it, I don't think you'd be fooled. A counterfeit always looks genuine at first glance. You would receive a $20 bill that looked genuine, but it might not be. And that's why we have to examine these popular worldly teachings that are cleverly cloaked with the Bible, they're flooding in our churches today. They provide half-truths as if they were the truth of God. Stephen Cole laid out three tests of sound doctrine that will keep us from being taken in by false teaching and false preaching. First, Does it honor God and exalt Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Ask yourself that. Sound doctrine always, always, always lifts God up. His majesty. His holiness. It exalts Jesus as fully God and fully man. Who gave himself for our sins and was raised bodily from the dead. It must contain all of that. Second, does it humble proud fallen sinners? Sound doctrine always brings sinners to the foot of the cross where they come to the end of their own. No more pride and self-sufficiency is allowed. Third, does it promote holiness? Sound teaching always results in obedience to the Word of God and progress in holy living. It leads to genuine love for God and love for others. Finally, this morning, we've been on the don'ts. We've been on the little more negative because that's the way these six verses today are aligned. You basically have four more negative verses Versus two positives. Wow, when I look at that, I think Paul had every reason to write, didn't he? There was a lot of things that were very negative going on. And same with our world today. We need to understand those don'ts very well. But as he concludes here in our fourth point today, the proper use of God's word requires, and I've got four things here. First of all, approach. 
The proper use of God's Word requires the proper approach. Now, in your bulletin or wherever you're writing, I'd like for you to parenthetically, next to approach, put the word diligence. Diligence. Do your best, verse 15. The word means to be diligent or zealous. We're to give constant effort to the task of being approved unto God as unashamed work people, which means handling God's word accurately. And this especially applies to those who teach the Bible, but also it applies to all believers who must be able to handle the word of God carefully. The key to being diligent in God's word is to be motivated. Motivation is the key to learning. It really is. Some of you are teachers or you work around teachers. You know what I'm talking about. You've got to motivate the kids. You've got to motivate the students. Have you ever been on an airplane and as everything starts winding down, people put their luggage up and we're getting ready to take off just before the airline attendant gives the instructions on how to use the emergency breathing apparatus. Oh, here we go again. Or whatever. What are the people doing? They're looking at their phones or, or they're just thinking impatiently, hurry up so we can get this thing going. They're not motivated to hear her boring instructions. Right? But suppose that you're airborne and the pilot comes on. And over the intercom says, ladies and gentlemen, we're experiencing some, some severe trouble with our engines. We're going to have to depressurize the cabin and make an emergency landing. The airline attendant is going to explain how to use the emergency breathing apparatus. Do you think that the pilot would have to add, please give her your full attention? I think we've got her attention people would be motivated. So the key to being motivated to be diligent in God's Word is to recognize I live in the presence of God. I live in the very presence of God wherever I be. I'm in the presence of God. And someday i got to give an account to Him. I'm motivated. Now I'm motivated when I really realize that. His word alone contains his wisdom on how to live in a way that pleases him, which is the only way to experience true joy. So I've got to be diligent to search out what the scriptures say about knowing God and his wisdom for living. Yes, approach is very important. But so is relationship. Relationship. Now, next to that word, I'd like for you to parenthetically put love. Love. The Bible is not just a book of principles for how to live. It tells us of Christ's enduring love for His bride. As His bride, we the church, we should seek to please Him and be available to do His will. You know, just like my bride, my wife now of 37 plus years I mean she's always available to do what I would like it's great that's just a very human example not necessarily always true doesn't work those that way perfectly but we as a church need to realize that and as such our focus should not be on what others think of us but on what God thinks. Too many pastors, and I think I've grown some in this way, I hope I have, but too many pastors fall into the trap of pleasing people. People pleasers. And they do so at the expense of not pleasing God. That's one reason, friends, I'm unashamed to preach this sermon today. Because it is God whom we should strive to please. While it's nice to be liked, I like to be liked. I imagine most of you like to be liked. 
Yeah, it's nice to be light. My main focus is and must be approved to God. I want to be approved to God. Our goal is to please our heavenly bridegroom who loved us and gave himself for us. See what the Christ did. When Jim Elliott, who was later martyred in the jungles of Ecuador, was a student at Wheaton College, he wrote in his diary, Well, my grades came through this week and were, as expected, lower than last semester. However, I make no apologies and admit I've let them drag a bit for study of the Bible, in which I seek the degree A. U-G. I'm getting my A-U-G degree. That is approved unto God. Come to the Bible to deepen your love life with the Lord. To learn how you can please Him more. The proper relationship, friends, is critical. Thirdly, there's skill. Skill. And next to that, put the word accuracy. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, handle, handling accurately the word of truth. And here, the metaphor is that of a craftsman. Now, I know nothing about this business other than when I've talked with people about it. But you're the carpenter, and God's word is your set of tools. Rather than being sloppy and nailing together a chicken coop that's about to fall down, do a decent job so that you will not be ashamed when God inspects your work. If a carpenter knows that his work will be inspected by a skilled master craftsman, he will not cut corners. He will do his best so that his work will be approved. In the same way, we need to use the tools of Bible study and interpretation to discover the meaning of each text in its biblical context. Otherwise, we're being sloppy workmen with God's word of truth. So, the proper skill is vital. And finally, foundation. The proper use includes the proper foundation. Now there, put in the words, the church. The church. The foundation refers to the true people of God, the church. Those who truly belong to the Lord are not carried away by false teaching. The foundation for using the Bible and using it properly is that God knows us as His own and that through our diligent, careful study and application of His Word of Truth, we are growing in godliness. In closing today, there was a young man who once studied violin under a world-renowned master. Well, when his first big recital came, the crowd cheered after each number. But the young performer seemed dissatisfied. Even after the final number, despite the rousing applause, the musician seemed unhappy. As he took his bows, he was watching an elderly man in the balcony. Finally, the elderly man smiled and nodded in approval. Immediately, the young man beamed with joy. He was not looking for the approval of the crowd. He was waiting for the approval from his master. Christians, we should be living for God's approval. 
we will be approved unto him as we use the Bible to grow in godliness as we stand squarely on God's word. May it be so. Let us pray. Today, Father, Lord, as we realize that you've given us an incredible gift in your word. May we not take the Bible for granted, nor lightly. Lord, may we just take it with all seriousness and study and, and do so so that we will be approved unto you, Lord. May we never, never misuse it, but only use it to glorify your name. And what we know through the scriptures, throughout God's word here, we know through your word is that Christ died once for all. Your son came. You so loved the world that you gave him. And he was willing to live among us as one of us and yet die. His life not being taken, but rather given. Lord, may we realize that there are so many right around us who don't understand that or if they've heard it, they don't believe it. May we live lives and may we apply your scriptures so that they would come to you and be drawn close to your word and way. May we be indeed a living Bible, each of us, as we go about our day-to-day -day work. May people see Jesus in us. Lord, for anybody who has not made that decision for Jesus Christ, may they not put it off, but rather come to you and come quickly. For we don't know when the day of the Lord will be. Help us to be a help to others and to be an inspiration truly by standing on your holy word. In Jesus Christ's holy, precious name we pray. Amen. As we sing uh, the song Worthy today, we know that only He is worthy. And the amazing thing is, though, that God, He considers us worthy. And that's incredible. I would just ask us today to, to really reflect on that. And say, you know, He's done everything for me. All that I have is from his hand. He's given us his holy word. He's given us the Bible. And we need to not misuse it. And certainly don't lose it. It's so easy to let Bible reading and Bible study slip away. Some of you here right now are probably thinking, you know what, I need to get back to my daily Bible reading. Yeah, you do. It's so important that we grow in Christ, that we understand His Word as best we can as the Holy Spirit leads us. Maybe today you'd like to rededicate your life in that regard, to come back to His Word and to strive to apply it properly and, and to live that Word each day. Maybe there's someone here today who needs to receive Jesus. This is your moment. I'll be standing right here as we sing. You can let it be known. Or perhaps moving a membership here. Whatever your decision is today, we'd love to have you at here at Hunton and be with us as we do our very best to live for him. So let us close our service here as we sing together, Worthy. <laughs> Whoa. Mm -hmm.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. In Christ's name we pray and come. Amen.